Welcome to John Gets Games, where today I'm bringing you part two of my most recent Games Radar vlog. Uh, now, if you missed it, I put out a part one a few days ago, and that had 30 games that I've learned about over the last couple of months. But in particular, those were the first 30 games in alphabetical order. And today we're going to cover the other 30 games because there were 60 games altogether that I wanted to talk about, and I just couldn't help but break it into two parts. Um, now, before we go into that, I do want to once again mention that if you want to, you can hear a podcast version of this episode by supporting the Patreon campaign for the channel by going to patreon.com slash Games. In fact, uh, the patrons of the channel got access to this part two immediately after part one came out, so they got early access to it. Uh, by being a patron of the channel, you can also gain access to other exclusive perks, like being able to watch my opinions episodes, where I talk about all of the games that I'm playing recently, the things I like and the things I don't, and also how my opinion is changing about these games as I continue to play them. Uh, also, as I said before, some videos you can gain access to early in advertisement free like this episode right here. Now before we jump back into these games, the last thing I'd like to ask is if while you're watching this you have any comments about any of the games that I talk about, or again if there are games that I did not talk about that you feel like I should have, then please comment about those down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's jump right back into it with game number 31, essentially, uh, and that is Life of the Amazonia. Uh, just like always, I'll be using the Board Game Geek for these uh, games as I talk about them. Uh, now, this one, uh, I I'm talking about it largely because they've got a bunch of vibrant photos of it, and it looks like there's some cool stuff going on with this game. Uh, there's too many mechanisms to fit in this area. It looks like there's uh, deck building, uh, hexagon grid, pattern building, set collection, but um, realistically, I think I'll start off with just an image of what's going on. There's this uh, three-dimensional, multi-tiered waterfall uh, score track. Um, there are hexagonal playing areas in front of probably each one of the players. Um, there's a bunch of different shaped animal meeples with um, silk screening on them, it looks like, like parrots and uh, cheetahs and that kind of thing. Um, also, there's little trees that you're putting onto the hexagon grid in front of you. Uh, there's a three-dimensional boat full of little tokens. There's just a lot of cool components uh, going on here, um, and, and that's not even talking about the mechanics. Uh, so now, speaking of the mechanics, let's go back to the description for this one. It says, this is a strategic meeple placing game that combines bag building and pattern building. Uh, players are going to restore land, place various animals, and plant trees and flowers to enrich their jungle and create the most ecologically rich jungle. Now, these things are going to be placed into the jungle, uh, taking into account different characteristics of plants and animals. You're trying to create synergies uh, with these different tokens, um, and it says that there are 60,000 plus ways that you can set up the animal cards and diverse strategic options in this game. So, honestly, I'm, I'm largely sold. Uh, this seems cool. It's got a bunch of things I like, 60 to 100 20 minutes, so it looks like it's not a terribly light game overall. Uh, again, uh, from the numerous images of what they have uh, on BGG, it just has a vibrant, wonderful look. Honestly, these components look great. Uh, so this is a game I think I can already say I would really like to try at some point, um, just from the table presence alone, but also I feel like the mechanics, at least as far as I can tell, will be um, the kind of thing I like to see in games, even though I don't really know much in the way of specifics. Uh, there are cards for various uh, animals with conditions on them. Um, oh, there's baby macaws, jaguar cubs. It's a very good looking game, I'll admit. Okay, next up we have Millennia. Uh, this says civilizations compete over thousands of years to crown the winner. Uh, interestingly enough, it's a 30 to 120 minute game. It's also one to four players, so I imagine they're trying to say it's 30 minutes per player. Uh, but anyway, uh, down here it says this is a competitive civilization game for one to four players. Uh, it's going to span several millennia, and um, in each one of the ages of the game, uh, there's several phases. So there's a technology phase. Uh, we're going to be uh, taking technology based off of the ones that are revealed. Um, there's a building phase where you're going to take turns uh, buying revealed cards, and then uh, also looks like make wonders. There's an action phase where you can activate the tech cards and the buildings um, that you already have, uh, rotating them to indicate that you've used them. Uh, and then there's a military phase where players reduce their position on the military track by an equal number of steps required to make the lowest position player land on a zero. Um, then the player uh, players score their position minus one victory point per defeat. So that's an interesting way to fight. So I guess if uh, one person's at three, another person's at five, another person is at nine, then uh, the person who's at nine would go down three times, essentially moving the three person down to zero, and then they would actually score for how the fighting works. 
that's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there's not a whole lot more about it, although, again, it's a 30-minute per player game. So it seems like there's probably a decent amount going on um, based off of what I can see in the description because there aren't really images of what the game looks like to play. Um, this seems to be a very card-oriented game. It says it features a game board and more than 300 cards with more than 200 unique card illustrations with motifs from different ages. That all sounds cool. Uh, we've got income. We've got open drafting, my favorite kind of drafting. Um, there's uh, simultaneous action selection. I, this game just seems like it could be cool. Again, it could also turn into something I'm not terribly interested in. This is all very high level, but what I see so far paints this to be a game that I would really not mind trying. Okay, next up we have Mists Over Carcassonne. Um, now I'm talking about this largely because I love Carcassonne. I guess in the previous episode, I think I said I only had one expansion to talk about, and I lied. <laughs> this is an expansion to Carcassonne. Uh, now, the uh, the key to this one, and the reason I'm talking about it, is because this is a cooperative version of the well-known game. Uh, now, actually... I'm not sure if this is an expansion. Uh, perhaps this is standalone. Yeah, actually, I think this is a standalone version of the game. Uh, specifically down here, it says uh, it includes rules to incorporate it with the regular competitive game. Uh, anyway, <laughs> in this game, uh, there is a mist kind of coming over the, the area of Carcassonne, and in that mist are a whole bunch of ghosts, little ghost meeples. <laughs> and uh, as I said, this is a cooperative game where you are trying to, I think not have all the ghosts go onto the board. So you're trying to like fully enclose these misty areas because that makes all the ghosts go away. Um, also, there's a score track in this game, but everybody's score is on the same token. Like there's there's just the player score and you have to hit a certain level. Um, my only real concern, my, my only real worry about this game is I can't see any way that it couldn't be potentially prone to one person just kind of quarterbacking all of it. And I know not every cooperative game can get away from that, but it I didn't see from what I've seen on the internet um, that there's anything that like uh, hides something from your partners around the table. Like it seems like you reveal the tile and then you put it onto a spot and the next person goes, they reveal their tile and they put it out into the spot. So you're probably just talking about it all the way through and that's fine. That's not like a, a death knell on the game, but I do tend to like a little bit of hidden information between partners when it comes to cooperative games. Honestly, cooperative games are far from my favorite type of game, but I love Carcassonne. Uh, so that is enough to have me quite intrigued. If I have an opportunity to try this one, I will certainly jump at the opportunity. Although so I, I think it's doubtful I'll, like, buy this game, mostly because, again, I find cooperative games intriguing, but but they're not my favorite. <laughs> All right, next up we have My Shelfie. Uh, this one is designed by Matthew Dunson and Phil Walker-Harding, uh, two people who have designed lots of games that I've really enjoyed in the past. Uh, so uh, Shelfie is oftentimes used in the board game world for being like, you know, a, a, an image of all your games on your shelf. And this one is taking that to a broader extent. Uh, this is a game uh, where you've just taken home a new bookshelf and it's time to put your favorite things on it, like books, board games, portraits, a whole variety of things, not just board games. Uh, now... Uh, that all sounds fine. I think it's a cute theme, but the thing that really got me interested in this game, <laughs> I'm a broken record, is the images on Board Game Geek. Um, so it looks like everyone has a Connect Four esque plastic shelf in front of them, a three dimensional, well, I guess it's a two dimensional shelf, but um, it's also standing upright, kind of like Connect Four. And then there is a board in the middle of the table, and players are going to be taking tiles from the middle of the board. I think you could take one, two, or three tiles, like starting at the edge and kind of working your way in, and then you're going to be. Uh, strategically placing these tiles down onto your shelf, like filling your shelf with books and cats, it looks like, trophies, portraits, board games, just all sorts of stuff that you're going to be sliding in there. Um, it looks like there are some goal cards where you want to have specific things on specific spots, but of course, you're dropping these things in. They slide down, you know, just like uh, Connect Four once again. And I think this looks cool. I think it's got a wonderful aesthetic. I think it has an awesome conceit overall. Uh, I like the puzzle of the, the kind of gravity puzzle, the top-down sliding of tokens. Um, I love pool drafting. I've mentioned it so many times. Uh, oh, that's interesting. There's an image of this one where it looks like um, each person has a hidden goal. Like the goal card is actually uh, standing up in a little stand facing you. So your opponent doesn't necessarily know what you're going after. Um, there's also some other cards off to the side that seem to provide other variable benefits. I'm not sure if those change from one game to the next, but either way, um, two designers who designed lots of great games, um, uh, two mechanics that I love with the, the gravity uh, placement on the shelf, as well as the pool drafting in the middle. This is a game that I, I really do want to try. 
All right, next up we have Nova Roma. Now the main reason I'm talking about this is because the designer is Stan Kordonsky, and he's designed a bunch of cool games in the past. Uh, uh, Dice Hospital, Rurik Dawn of Kiev, uh, Lockup, Old West Empresario, uh, 24, it looks like, games overall on BGG. So they definitely know how to design a good game. Uh, now in this game, it's a 60 to 120 minute game where you are the head of an ancient and noble Roman house helping Emperor Constantine establish a new castle. So this is a game about deploying your family members uh, and retainers to accomplish a variety of goals. You're going to be getting building materials, constructing palaces, securing sea routes, racing in the Hippodrome, and attracting population to the new capital. Uh, and so this is a city building, Hippodrome, racing, estate management, cooperative Euro game. Oh, cooperative Euro game. I totally missed that. <laughs> like I said, I had like a hundred games that I was looking at and I completely missed that part of it. I don't even see cooperative down here in the mechanisms. So I'm curious, maybe it's a competitive game where you're kind of cooperating to get to a victory or maybe it's just cooperative and it doesn't say that over here. Anyway, I'm really curious about this game. I like city building. Racing sounds fun. Uh, estate management, that sounds cool. I love Euro games. It's got a unique pattern building grid activation game mechanism, which is another great way to make me talk about things in these games radar blogs. Uh, unique mechanism uh, with some words mixed in there is probably going to draw my att attention quite a bit. So there doesn't appear to be any other information about this game. It's a 2023 release, so that's not too surprising. Uh, but this is something that I really want to learn more about. All of those different things seem cool. It just seems like there's not a lot known about it right now, but everything that I do know is pointing towards this being a game that I do want to play. So hopefully that is actually the case once I actually have an opportunity to do that. Next up, we have Point City. Uh, so this one uh, comes from the team that brought you the smash hit, Point Salad. Uh, Point Salad was a lovely little game, like incredibly simple game about trying to uh, get stuff and get cards that score for your stuff. So like I got a carrot and then I got a card that scores for carrots. And it was all about balancing how much stuff you had versus how many cards you had that scored based off of your stuff. Uh, so it says that this is brought to us by the same team. Uh, this is a fast and fun card drafting engine building game for the whole family. There was no engine building in, uh, in uh, Point Salad. So that's a little bit of a difference here. Uh, there's 150 unique building cards um, that you can use to create different cities each time you play. And it says the rules are simple, which is not surprising considering Point Salad was also super simple. You're going to take two adjacent cards from a dynamic city grid, and then you're going to add them into your expanding city. You're going to use the, your resource cards and bonuses to construct building cards that require specific combinations, and you're going to build vital civic structures to multiply your city's points and be the top urban planner. So I'm not too surprised to see it has a playtime of 15 to 30 minutes, because that's around where Point Salad was as well. And this just seems like it could be another lovely, smart, incredibly simple game, much like Point Salad. Um, I wouldn't say Point Salad was like my favorite game, but it's still in our collection. I haven't played it in quite a while, but I certainly wouldn't mind doing so in the future. And this game looks like it's probably going to be following into a pretty similar spot. I don't think I'm going to run out and buy this game, but I would certainly not turn down the opportunity to try it, especially considering it's going to be probably a brief uh, experience. Like it wouldn't surprise me if this is one of those games that takes like five minutes to learn and then like, you know, 20 minutes to play overall. Either way, it looks fun. And if it's, you know, anywhere near as fun as Point Salad was, then it's certainly a game I'd like to play. Moving on, we now have Pollen. Uh, now, this one jumped out to me for a couple of reasons. The first is the designer is Reiner Kinesia, and the second is that it re-implements Samurai the card game, which is genuinely a game I did not know existed, but I did know that Samurai existed, which came out back in 98. So uh, Samurai the card game came out in 2009, and that, I guess, is a card game version of Samurai. I I've only played Samurai on the iPhone version. I haven't played it with other people, and I really would like to try. Uh, it's a kind of game where you're putting these tokens down trying to surround various things and get some majorities. And I imagine something similar to that is happening in Samurai the uh, card game. And then, uh, of course, I'm not supposed to be talking about Samurai the card game right now. I'm supposed to be talking about Pollen, uh, which is the game I'm here to discuss. So this is a re-implementation of Samurai the card game. Right now, there are no images on BGG except for a beautiful box cover. It's really nice. It's interesting. This is not the first game I'm talking about today that's about Pollen or like leaves and fluttering things. And anyway, so in this game, you're creating a lush garden of beautiful blooms in order to attract helpful pollinators. So that's definitely, <laughs> it's one of those things where like, I'm surprised I said pollinator twice in, in these videos. I guess the first one was in the other part. So that's the first time I've said it in this one. Uh, anyway, uh, in this game, it looks like you are 
creating this garden by putting these cards down. I imagine they have symbols on them, somewhat similar, but probably much more beautiful than in that Samurai the Card game. I imagine you're trying to surround things based off of the symbols, or I guess flower types, or maybe butterfly types in this one. Again, there are no images of this one, but um, it's coming from board game tables, and they make very good looking games. So I'm sure there's going to be more information about this one soon, and I am actively interested in learning more about it. Let's move on to the next game, and that one is Portents. Uh, you're going to manipulate sacrifices on the altar to tell the king's fortune and save your own neck. Uh, so this one's coming out from New Mill Industries. That's a uh, small indie board game publisher. It's a couple of people um, putting out, I think, print-on-demand type Kickstarter games, where they do Kickstarters, and then they they, they return it so fast. Uh, I did the uh, Union uh, Station Kickstarter for that one, and like two months later, after the Kickstarter was over, the game was shipped over to me because I think they do print-on-demand anyway. <laughs> this is a two-player game, or a one-to-two-player game, that takes 20 to 30 minutes. And again, it's all about being a fortune teller, specifically the last two fortune tellers of the king. And the king is, I guess, trying to figure out which fortune teller to go with. Um, there's a decent amount of uh, information here in the description, but what it appears to be at a high level is a game about manipulating this altar, where various things have been scattered. You've got, like, bird's wings, bones, skulls, you know, chicken feet, that kind of thing. And I believe you're going to be um, under turn manipulating these around to try and put them into situations that are good for you and bad for your opponent. Um, the aesthetic of this game is lovely. They're really nice components. Honestly, the nicest components that I've seen from a uh, New Mill Industries game. Not that their components are bad uh, at all, but this looks really nice for what the kind of stuff they've done in the past. Um, it's my understanding they're going to have a Kickstarter campaign going out for this one relatively soon, and I will be actively looking into that because I feel like they've uh, published some pretty cool games in the past. I don't play two-player games all that often, but still, uh, I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of information on that Kickstarter page when that goes out. So hopefully I'll learn more about this one soon and know if this is one that I want to back, much like I backed a couple other New Mill games, like uh, uh, Union Station and another one. But either way, uh, that is Portents. Uh, also, I just love the design aesthetic <laughs> of the front cover of this one and, again, the components. It's just a really good-looking game. All right, next up we have Rebuilding Seattle. So this one says, The Great Fire of 1889 has burned down most of downtown Seattle, and you are the city planner tasked with rebuilding it. We have to manage economic resources to improve neighborhoods, erect new buildings and iconic landmarks, and address the needs of the ever-growing population to make Seattle better than ever. So it says, In this game, you are responsible for managing the zoning and expansion of this major neighborhood. And this is a grid coverage income tile line game. There's a whole bunch of images of it on uh, B at the moment. Uh, there's not a whole bunch of details about how it actually plays, but it looks like you have cards with various monuments. Um, you got bridges and stuff that you might be putting down. Um, there's tracks uh, and more cards. Uh, it just seems like there's a decent amount going on. Multiple different tracks on the Capitol Hill board. So I think there is uh, quite a bit that you're going to be uh, crunching through as you're playing this game. Oh, also there are these uh, kind of city planning tiles. It looks like there's a two by four tile uh, split into a grid. So essentially eight different spots on it, and you're going to be maybe putting it in front of you, doing some tile laying, which again, man, I do like that, uh, trying to match up some symbols. Uh, so there's just a lot of stuff here that seems like it could be cool. I like tracks. I like placing tiles. I like activating various effects on various cards. Uh, it's a 60 to 120 minute game, so definitely not like a light game. It seems like this is much more of a medium uh, type game, which is a little surprising coming from WizKids. I feel like their games tend to be more in the like 30 to 60 minute time frame versus 60 to 120 minutes. Um, anyway, I I'm quite looking forward to learning more about this one. I've actually done sponsored videos for most of the games that WizKids has put out this year, and it's possible I might do one for this one, but it's not uh, guaranteed just yet. Okay, we can move on to the next game, which is Reflecto. Uh, move your letters to make the word or guess the opponent's word with a mirror. Now, I actually know a lot about this game because uh, the publisher Mandu Games sent me uh, a press copy of it. <laughs> so this one is kind of like Checkers, the mirror word deduction game, if that makes sense. So you're going to be starting the game uh, putting a five-letter word uh, down in front of you, and you're going to split that out into each letter onto little dry erase tokens on seven of these um, uh, Checkers-type figures that are tokens that stand up on the board. Uh, five of them are dry erase markers, and then two of them are mirrors. And in this game, you're just kind of moving around sort of like checkers, but not exactly. Uh, you can use all of the grid, uh, and you're potentially hopping over opposing pieces, but you never remove them. But the idea is that you are trying to get your mirrors ahead of your opponent's pieces so that you can glance into the mirror on your piece to look back at the letter. But here's the thing. 
your opponent doesn't know which of your pieces are mirrors. So you want to not only move these to obfuscate what they are, but then also you don't want to like lean super hard over to make it obvious that you just moved a mirror and you now want to get a look. So it seems like you have to be uh, stealthy, like, you know, kind of scratch your chin and it's like, you know, pretend to glance at something else as you're kind of leaning over to try and see what those are. And if you can ever guess your opponent's word, you just say it and then you either win if you got it right or you immediately lose if you got it wrong or you're just playing to try and move your tokens all the way to the other edge of the board. But here's another catch. Uh, once they reach the end, they will leave the board, essentially being safe for you, only if you do them in order, like the order of the word. So if your word is piano and you get your N all the way over there, you're gonna have to wait until the P, the I, and the A have all reached that back row before you can actually remove the N. I haven't played it yet, even though I have a copy of it here. It seems fascinating. I'm not even sure how much fun it's gonna be, but I'm looking forward to trying it because it just seems like a wacky combination of various concepts. Okay, next up we have Rise. This is a 60-minute uh, Euro game coming out from uh, DLP Games and Capstone Games. Uh, now, this one um, has me interested largely just because of the pedigree of the publishers. Also, one of the designers is Marco Pronzo, who's designed some pretty cool stuff in the past. The other one is Remo Canzadori, and they have published a fair number of games. I don't actually think I've played any of them, but either way, coming back to this game. Uh, in this game, you're assuming the responsibility for the economic and social development of a city. Uh, there are not many limits to your possibilities. You have various tracks that you can influence uh, in order to best help out your citizens. Um, you're trying to improve culture, science, and political relations. You're trying to do a whole bunch of, you know, city planning type stuff, which is also a thing I feel like I've talked about uh, more often in these episodes. Now it says, this game revolves around 10 tracks on which you move your markers to gain further effects and gather influence. And here's my favorite word, uh, the unique and innovative card mechanism, uh, which includes events and tough decisions will change your decision-making from one round to the next. So we've got, uh, as far as mechanisms are concerned, an action queue, track management, uh, turn order, uh, claiming uh, variable setup, and there is an image of what the game looks like in play, and there's a whole bunch of boards, there's a whole bunch of tracks, there's a whole bunch of cards, there's a whole bunch of tokens. Honestly, this has the look of like a two-hour Euro game, but it says 60 minutes here on BGG, which honestly makes me even more curious because uh, I, I love to see those games that can play in a tighter time frame. I don't need to be a broken record. I've talked about that enough in these episodes. But either way, Rise looks quite cool, and uh, I'm looking forward to having a shot to try it. Next up, we have Siliconvania, which uh, does not have any images on BGG, but there's a decent description. However, I know all about this game because uh, WizKids hired me to do rulebook proofing for it. So I read through the rulebook and every single one of the, like, over 100 cards in the game to proof it for mistakes and clarity and all that kind of stuff. And this looks like a pretty neat little game. Um, now, I did that proofing a couple of weeks ago, but either way, uh, in this game, you are going to be bidding with cards that you have in your hand to take these uh, tiles in a vampire-themed Silicon Valley. That's it, Sil Silicon Valley, Siliconvania, Transylvania, that's the kind of thing they're going on there. Uh, so in this game, you're gonna be bidding on a pair of building tiles that you're gonna be adding into your grid, um, but once you put them down, it's very hard to move them. Uh, you're also going to do another round of bidding for specialist cards, which give you abilities, and to get new specialist cards. And the cards that you bid with, well, the ones that have stronger bids have weaker abilities and vice versa. So that's kind of cool. And then you also commit a specialist card for its scoring condition, uh, putting it off to the side, like removing it uh, in order to earn points at the end of the game. So there is a spatial element to this game. It's a square grid that you're putting these different tokens down into, trying to get uh, big groups of little blood icons, if I remember correctly. You know, vampires love that kind of stuff. Uh, there's also like metro stations and there's uh, like mausoleums, there's castles that can be put around the outside of it that are going to score you points. And then of course you're also doing some hand management, trying to figure out which of the cards you want to bid with because also those cards and the cards that you take from the area are going to help dictate the cards that you can use for end game scoring. It seems like there's a lot of really cool stuff going on uh, for a 45 to 90 minute game. Um, much like I said before, I'm not 100% if I'm going to be making a tutorial video for this one, but I have made videos for a lot of the WizKids games, and I thought this game looked cool. I I'm certainly interested in playing this one after uh, uh, proofreading the rulebook. Okay, next up we have one of the quickest ones I'll have to talk about. That is Savernake Forest? Savernake Forest? Anyway, it says you help your animal friends prepare for winter. I almost didn't talk about this one because there is so little about it on BGG. It says winter is closing in uh, on the forest and all the animals scurry about trying to put together a nice pantry so that they can make it to spring. In Savernake 
forest. You clear the paths and help your friends spend their cold days under the warm blanket uh, with a full belly. And that's it. I mean, there's an image of the box cover, and it has nice cartoony art on it, but there's no mechanisms, uh, there is no time, there's no player count, so I really don't know much, and so I'm just intrigued. Uh, I'd like to learn more about it. It's being published by Devere, who makes very good-looking games. I think it has a cute premise overall. I just have no idea if it's a cooperative game, what kind of mechanics might be coming into it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I'm subscribed to this one to learn more about it, because currently there is very, very little. But if you like what you see, then maybe this is one that you're going to want to keep your eye out on as well. All right, next up we have Segment Tricks, uh, which is also known as Seven Segment Tricks. Uh, now, this is another uh, card game designed by Taiki Shinzawa. I talked about that designer a couple of times in the first one of these parts. Uh, now, I have not played this game, but I've learned about it along with a lot of card games over the last couple of months, and this one seemed really fascinating. So, in this game, it's a trick-taking game where you're going to be putting cards down with numbers on them, and the numbers are um, oriented in that seven-segment style, like think of an alarm clock or something like that where when you light up different segments, it kind of makes the different shapes. And the trick for this game is that when you put a card down, you can then alter that card by putting these little segments on top of it, which will change the value of that card. And you have a certain number of these segments in front of you. So maybe you put a, you know, zero down and you want it to be something else. Actually, I haven't played it, so I'm not sure the specifics of it, but you can put like a two or a three or a nine or something down and change what the value of that card is by spending these tokens. And here's the other part of the hook. Um, it's a trick-taking game where you're going to keep the tricks in front of you, and you're trying to make your bid, and your bid is the number of segments that are still in front of you at the end of the hand. And that sounds really cool. So you start with a whole bunch of these, so you need to use them because you're probably not going to be winning that many tricks. So you want to spend these tokens to modify the numbers of the cards, either up or down, um, you know, in the direction that's going to be good for you based off of how your bids are going, and you want to level out having an exact number of these for the bid that you've won. And what a weird idea. Yeah. I'm not even sure if this would be all that fun, but this is another one of those games that I would love to try at least once, just to say I did, because the idea of playing cards and then modifying them on the fly sounds really interesting. You know, it's a card game where you get a random hand of cards, and usually those are the cards that you have to use. Like, some games let you maybe flip a card over to have different options. Uh, some other games uh, can let you, like, modify the card, like Pups. You can play a 7 and then add plus 2 to make it a 9. But in this one, it's even more amorphous than that by putting these down, and that just seems absolutely Absolutely fascinating to me. All right, next up we have Stonks. Uh, it's a 2024 game, so not coming out anytime soon. It says investors pump and dump stocks to become the richest one in the market. It's a 20 to 45 minute game, so it's pretty quick. And it says this is a trick taking stock marketing game where each card is a share and each suit is a company. Now, I already have a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a trick taking stock market game. I just realized I'm going to be talking about it in just a little bit. I uh, haven't quite gotten there yet. So this is the first of these trick-taking stock games I'm talking about. I haven't played this one. Obviously, it's not coming out for a couple of years, but I like stock market type games and I enjoy trick-taking games. So I think it's really interesting to see those combined. Uh, in this one, it seems like, you know, the suits are matched up with various companies, which is the way the other one works as well. Uh, but then based off of how you put these cards down, it's going to affect the, uh, the value of these companies. There's not, not a whole lot of information and honestly, that is also the same in the other one that I'm going to be talking about soon. But either way, I'm just curious to see more information about this because I enjoy trick taking and I enjoy stocks. And maybe this is one that does something different from the other one that again I'll be talking about very soon, uh, enough to differentiate it to make me want to play it. Either way, there's not much information, so I'm looking forward to learning more. Next up, we have Sunday. It says, create a Sunday for each customer, attract the most customers to win. Uh, now, this game is designed by Carol Legrau and Sean Ross, Sean Ross being the designer of Haggis and many other good games. Uh, Dickory is a card uh, shedding game that I talked about I think in last month's update blog, I really enjoyed that one. Anyway, this is a domino game. So much like a lot of the games uh, Sean Ross in particular has been designing recently, um, you can just play it by reading the rules, as long as in this case you have dominoes in order to do it. So this game seems to be a little bit funky. I don't fully understand. There is a rulebook on BGG. I just didn't have the time to read it. 
but it seems like this isn't necessarily a trick-taking game, and it's also not necessarily like a card-shedding kind of game, or I guess a domino-shedding game. It seems like it's a game about trying to get different patterns at the right time. Uh, I saw one forum post that said it was maybe kind of like Battle Line in that way, but in this game there are seven customer tokens put between the players, and uh, a double nine set of dominoes, and then you're going to take turns playing dominoes to your side of the row of customers, and then you're going to refill your hand, and if you get three dominoes, which are three scoops of your Sunday, uh, then that makes a Sunday, and then these Sundays are compared to see which customer uh, prefers that specific ice cream scoop, and then you play until uh, somebody has claimed four out of the seven customers. Uh, it says it's a 20 to 30 minute game, and that just sounds interesting. Uh, you know, like I said, usually when I hear Sean Ross, I think about um, trick-taking or shedding or whatnot, and this just seems to be in its own uh, type of world. You're not doing either of those things. You're trying to get the right combos in at the right time to kind of claim these different things, and this certainly seems like a game that I would not say no to playing, although we don't actually have a set of dominoes in the house, I don't think. But either way, maybe at some point I'll have a chance to try this one. All right, next up we have Tatsu. Now, I'm talking about this one because it re-implements Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, that's not to be confused with Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> and I say that because Jekyll and Hyde is a two-player trick-taking game that came out within the last year or so, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a four-player team-based trick-taking game that came out in 1997, so a lot longer ago. Now, I've been wanting to try Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for a while, ever since it was talked about on the Hidden Gems podcast. They really enjoyed it, and it seemed like the main catch for this game is the cards um, in this deck that you're going to be shuffling up and handing out are associated with, you know, the Jekyll or the Hyde. There's also another implementation that's kind of Greek gods-themed. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is the kind of game where you could have a hand of cards that are associated with your opponent, and you're not allowed to play your opponent's cards. And when it's your turn, it's my understanding, you either play a card uh, or you tell somebody else to play a card. Like you tell your partner, you play a card instead of me, or you tell an opponent to play a card. And the idea of playing a game where it might make sense to tell your opponents that they should play a card, that just sounds so weird. <laughs> so I'd really like to try it. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is virtually impossible to find a copy of, but it's getting re-implemented as Tatsu, and it's uh, being released, I think, very soon. Uh, honestly, the artistic aesthetic of this one looks nicer. It's kind of got, like, dragons on them, uh, which seem pretty neat. And uh, yeah, it's, I think, just a straight re-implementation. It's a trick-taking game for two to four players. I'm not sure how it works at less than four. I, honestly, this might be a game where the partnerships change. Again, I haven't actually played it. But either way, this game has been strongly recommended by many people. I also know some people who played the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and kind of bounced off it. They thought it was just a little bit too weird and not really their thing. So a game that's that's very strange and maybe even polarizing is a game that I would like to try, especially if it's, you know, just 20 to 30 minutes. So this is one I continue to want to play, and I think it's much more likely I'll be able to do so considering it's getting this beautiful re-implementation. Oh, the publisher is Madigo. Um, they're a big publisher, so that means it'll probably be even more easy to get access to it as well. Okay, next up we have Terraforming Mars, the dice game. Uh, this one just went up on Kickstarter, and I, I backed it already. Uh, I love Terraforming Mars, and I like dice games. And uh, from what I saw, um, looking at the Kickstarter page for this one, it seems like this is an engine-building game, much like, you know, other versions of Terraforming Mars. Uh, but it's also a dice game where the resources, I think, the resource cards that you put in front of you, will kind of dictate the dice that you're going to roll. But it's not a dice game where you roll your dice every turn. It seems like it's the kind of game where you either do a dice rolling turn or you do an activating turn. So, you know, dice are still super important to this game as far as I can tell, but a lot of dice games are just like, it's your turn, roll dice, do something. And this one seems like it's got more going on to it. It definitely seems like it has tableau building and engine building, um, unlike uh, Ares' uh, Expedition. Uh, this one has a, a, an actual board that you're going to be putting on, uh, putting tokens onto, and I think the positioning probably matters. Uh, so yeah, I I'm super intrigued by this one. Again, I love Terraforming Mars as a base. I like engine building as a base. I like uh, engine building dice games, being able to increase the number of dice that you can roll and being able to cultivate the different types of dice that you roll. That's all stuff that I really enjoy. So it's very likely this is a game that I'm going to like as well. And like I said, I, I already backed the Kickstarter, <laughs> so I'm going to be getting a copy of it. All right, next up we have The Fox Experiment. This is a strategy game with lots of dice, dry erase cards, and cute foxes. <laughs> That's a really funny uh, tagline there. Now it says, in 1958, uh, there was an experiment about uh, fox domestication. Uh, they took a large group of foxes, and then they selected the ones that reacted to the humans with the most uh, curiosity and least aggression. Then they bred those together, and then in the next generation, they did this again, and then they, they bred those together, and they kept doing this, trying to see how quickly you could domesticate a wild animal like a fox. Uh, that's something that 
legitimately happened, and this is a game um, all about that. Uh, the designer of this game is Elizabeth Hargrave, and it says one more. Uh, also, Jeff Frazier. I don't recognize them. It looks like they just have a few uh, design credits, but either way, um, this game seems cool. I mean, that uh, study is, is fascinating, but then also the idea of, in this game, you're gonna be uh, selecting these uh, foxes and breeding them together, and it's my understanding, uh, it did say there's a lot of dice, uh, it's my understanding that when they breed, you roll the dice, and I think that's a great implementation of the, the Punnett Square idea of uh, uh, genomics that I remember from high school like 20 years ago, where you can have some idea about the outcomes of a breeding pair, but there's still some randomness there, like a 20, 25% chance of this and a 75% chance of that. And it seems like in this game, you're going to uh, do that by actually rolling these dice, which is interesting. You're also going to be doing dry erase boards. You're going to be rolling a whole bunch of dice. I don't really know much more than that, but this seems cool. Um, the design pedigree is absolutely there. The, uh, the the production quality of this looks really good. There are a lot of dice. I would definitely agree with that statement. And it says it's a 60 minute game. Um, this looks like a lot of fun. This is very much down my alley. Oh, there's a Kickstarter campaign going for it. I legitimately didn't see that. I should look into that campaign and see if this is something I want to back. Uh, either way, for now, I, I'm quite interested in this one. Uh, this feels like a game I can already say I actively want to play. Okay, next up we have The Mirroring of Mary King, which is a really weird looking game. So <laughs> this is a two player game, it's 20 to 45 minutes. And the theming of it uh, is that one of the people is a mortal contemporary woman named Mary King. And the other player is the ghost of Mary's long dead ancestor, a 17th century Scottish merchant Burgess of the same name. So uh, during a week's holiday uh, in Edinburgh, Mary gets very close to their long dead ancestor or the ghost of their long dead ancestor. And that ghost uh, is hungry and wants to live again. So that ghost is possessing Mary King. And the way this game works is you actually have a tableau of tiles that um, in when they're in color show Mary King as the contemporary person. And then the flip side of them is the ghost version of Mary King. And as you're playing this game, you are playing cards that have various patterns on them and those flip these. So it's kind of like one of those lights out kind of games almost where, you know, you, you, you click a button and it flips all the things that are adjacent. Well, this one, you're not clicking a button, but you're going off the pattern, flipping these things over, trying to vie back and forth to have essentially area control over the soul of Mary King, which is just, <laughs> again, a wacky theme. It seems like it's probably a pretty light game, but also an interesting puzzle. Um, and, you know, again, from a theme perspective, I think this one hits it out of the park. Um, the artistic aesthetic of it is is great as well. Um, it's not a terribly long game, but I could definitely see it being a really interesting um, tit for tat kind of game, flipping these things over. I think there's a little bit more to it based off of the, at the end of the round, uh, considering how much majority control you have over this. But again, one person's trying to possess a person and the other person is trying not to be possessed. And that was too cool for me not to talk about it in this episode. Well, let's move on to the next game and that is The Rich and the Good. So this is a... A re-implementation? I guess just a new version of a game uh, that was previously called Hab and Gut. Uh, I'm sure that's not how you pronounce that. Uh, I'd never heard of this game before, but I just watched a how to play video and this game looks super interesting. So it's kind of a stocks market game with some collaboration between the players. So it, it seems relatively simple, honestly. Um, there are these uh, five different commodities, uh, six different commodities it looks like. And in each one of the rounds, you're gonna be either buying or selling these commodities, essentially buying stocks in them. And then after everybody does that, you're gonna be playing cards. But here's the catch. You're gonna play a card from those in front of you and they might do something like increase the red commodity by four or decrease the black commodity by six. But in addition to that, let's see if there's a good image uh, illustrating this. Uh, in addition to that, you're also gonna play one card from the person's hand to your right. So that means you have your hand and you're sharing it with the partner to the right, but that also means the person sitting to your left is sharing your hand. Now you can see your hand and the person to the right. You can't see the hand of the person to your left who is sharing your hand. And this all seems absolutely wacky. <laughs> I mean, that's largely the game. It's just trying to buy low, sell high, trying to manipulate these things in ways that are good for you while also understanding that just because a card is in front of you doesn't mean you'll have access to use it to manipulate things later in the future because um, you, your opponent might do it. And here's the other catch. When you use a card or the second card that you use will have its uh, modification value halved. So again, if you have a card like um, plus four in your hand and you might be thinking, okay, I'm gonna use this for plus four, but then it's the second card picked by the person to your left. Well, they might make that 
um, plus two instead, and suddenly you're not getting that big advantage. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about this game from pretty much everybody who I've heard say anything about it. Um, it also has this wacky charity thing where you need to give uh, these stocks to charity, which means you're essentially flushing money down the drain, at least as far as like points. Like at the end of the game, you, you get the points value for your stocks, but not the ones that you give to charity. But the person who gives the least to charity just loses. So you also have this thing where you, you need to give to charity. Like you're rich and you should donate your money, but you also, you know, you just don't want to be the person who donates the least. And all that sounds fun. So again, this is a re-implementation. Um, it sounds like a game that I'm, I would really like to play because I'm enjoying stocks games for sure, and especially shared incentives, but also shared sharing hands, which sounds pretty bonkers. Uh, so hopefully I'll have a chance to do that, uh, either the old version or this new version that's coming out. All right, next up we have The Two Heirs. Uh, now this game really came out of nowhere. I, I got pretty excited about this one when I started learning about it. It's a one to two player game, 30 to 60 minutes, and it says you have to prove that you are a better heir by leading the kingdom to glory. Now that's a very vague thing. Uh, what is actually happening here is this is a strategic competitive tableau building game for one to two players, and you're taking on the role of two siblings who are trying to impress their royal father so that they will get to rule instead of their other sibling. <laughs> now, the way the game actually works, there's a rule book on BGG that I skimmed. The way the game works is you have a rondelle, and on your turn, you have to take a tile going clockwise from the position of the token on the rondelle. I, I can't remember how many positions away you go, but after you take one of these, you move that token and then you flip it over to show your opponent's crest, and that means they'll get to move from there. But then after you take that card, you then can, or I guess tile, you can then play these tiles in front of you um, into a tile laying area. And I'm such a broken record when it comes to, you know, tile laying and rondelle type things. I mean, if you've been listening to the rest of these episodes, you'll know that this is a bunch of stuff that I like. Uh, the playtime seems great. It seems like it's probably got a great, um, you know, I do this to block you from doing that uh, type of uh, vibe. You must take one of these tiles, but maybe you take one that isn't great for you because you don't like those options, but you intentionally move this far enough so that your opponent can't get access to that tile that you know would be really good for them. I love all that kind of stuff in games. So this one seems super cool. And it's my understanding this one is going to be available at Spiel in just a couple of weeks. Um, I, I think I can uh, definitely say that if I was going to Spiel, which I'm not, that if I was going to Spiel, this is a game that would be on my list to buy. <laughs> it just seems super cool. All right, let's now move on to the next game, which is The Wolves, um, which is, you know, I guess we talked about foxes before. Foxes and wolves are different. But anyway, uh, this is a game about establishing your pack of wolves dominance over the course of a moon cycle. It's a 75 minute game, so not too terribly long. And it says this is a pack building strategy game for two to five players. And it's survival of the fittest as you compete to build the largest and most dominant pack by claiming territory, recruiting lone wolves, and hunting prey. It says you want to be careful not to expand too recklessly though into terrain where your rivals thrive because they might lure members of your pack away. Now, it says there is a clever action selection mechanism that drives your choices. Um, with each of these actions, you're going to flip a terrain tile in front of you, and uh, that is going to dictate uh, where you can actually take the action. Um, there are double-sided tiles, which means the action that you take this round will then set you up to do various things in the next round. Um, there's a few other things going on, and there are some images of what the game looks like uh, in play. It's got a wonderful hex grid. Uh, it's got some really great-looking components, and yeah, it looks like the players have six different terrain tiles in front of them. So I'm not sure if you have to go like left to right or if you can choose any of them, but either way, it seems like these are double-sided and you, you know, flip them over to activate things on those various terrains, trying to, again, make a big uh, dominant pack of these wolves. I don't really know much more than that, but so far that sounds really cool. It looks good on the table. It seems like it's got a great uh, weight and length, and also it just seems like it has some mechanics that I haven't really seen before, and that makes me certainly intrigued enough to want to play this one. All right, let's now move on to the next game, which is Thiefdom. It says, in this game, players feel a similar tension like in stealth computer games. It's kind of a funny tagline. Uh, so it's a 60 to 120 minute game. And it says that in this game, you represent competing thief guilds who rob from the rich medieval town called Bacharach to be declared the most skillful thief guild. Uh, this is a strategic cutthroat and thematic pick up and deliver game uh, where you're gonna control three thief meeples and you're gonna try to avoid the four city guards uh, who try to bust any thief that they run into. So the city guards are controlled by all of the players and they limit the kind of things that you can do and the thieves circumvent those city guards um, uh, using equipment like grapples, climbing tools, and various other things. So it says in this game, there is uh, a planning phase. You're gonna go through various nights. You're gonna start by simultaneously planning 
the order in which you want to move your three uh, thief figures. So, um, oh, and the neutral figures that um, that you control for the night, uh, like carriages, citizens, and and guards. So it's got kind of programming, I guess, you know, simultaneous uh, action programming. Then players are going to do those actions in their predefined order, and then you clean up and prepare for the next night. Uh, and it looks like there are modular, double-sided town quarters. Um, it, again, it makes a unique pickup and deliver puzzle in each game. Um, that sounds cool. There's no images of what the game looks like, but there is a nice... Oh, actually, I take it back. There is an image of what the game looks like. It's a big square grid, a whole bunch of cards in front of you. I guess that's programming the various actions that you're going to do. There's tokens in front of you as well. Yeah, th this just looks really neat. Uh, I enjoy programming games. I wouldn't say they're my favorite type of game, but I've definitely enjoyed them in the past. Uh, this is a great look to it, and um, I, I think that's a neat idea, like programming out not only your stuff, but also the neutral stuff out there trying to get to things. Uh, it's kind of like a hidden movement game, but everyone is hidden? Well, maybe not. I guess you could see what people are doing. It's a hidden action game. You're like wondering, what is my opponent going to do, and how can I try to play off of what I think they're going to do, and then you're going to, I guess, flip the cards over and realize that you probably had it all wrong. Either way, this game looks quite cool. It's got a great aesthetic to it, so this is one I would certainly like to try at some point. All right, next up we have Trick and Trade, which is the game I kept alluding to when I was talking about Stonks, which was another trick-taking uh, stock market game. So Trick and Trade is a game that I own. Um, I've actually played it a couple of times, even though I only have one log play. I need to fix that. Um, this is a wonderful game. I really, really like it. And just like Hachi Train uh, that I talked about in the previous part, I don't want to turn this into a review. So I'll say that this is a may-follow trick-taking game. So um, somebody leads a color, and then everyone else can play any card they want to. And then once everybody has played a card, then in the relative value order of those cards, you can take these uh, stock, uh, I guess they're kind of cryptocurrency, but whatever, they're stocks. You take these stock cards and put them in front of you, and then the uh, winning card for each of these tricks goes into a majority area, which will fluctuate the relative value of the uh, four, yeah, four different um, uh, stock types that are in the game. And it's a one-hand game. Uh, so you deal out a hand of cards, and then you play all the cards one at a time, after that, the game is over, and you see who won. I played this twice. I really like it. Uh, it's it's super smart. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get a copy of right now. Um, I got this one through that same freight forwarder that I got Hachi Train from. Uh, so I strongly recommend it if you have a chance to actually try this one, even though, again, those chances are pretty fleeting right now. Um, I think this is an incredibly smart game, and I hope it gets picked up for a broader audience because I think a lot of people would really enjoy this. It's got some other cool things, like the person who wins the trick isn't necessarily the person who's going to be the lead player, in the next round. There's just a lot of really smart decisions in a really small package, and I've been super impressed. Uh, either way, again, not a review, but, <laughs> but I do like this one, and I just learned about it, you know, again, about two months ago, and I've already, you know, put it in an order and got it and played it and all that kind of stuff because I'm playing a lot of card games right now. Okay, let's now move on to the next game, and it is Trick Takers. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but this is a trick-taking game. Uh, now, specifically, it says eight trick takers with unique styles compete in a battle of tricks, but realistically, this is a highly asymmetric trick-taking game. Um, it has uh, this base game of eight characters. There's also an expansion, which brings in seven more characters, and then a different kind of expansion that changes the rules. But realistically, this is a standard trick-taking type game, but you're going to play through three rounds, and in each one of the game's rounds, you're going to choose a a different character, and those characters completely upend all of the uh, incentives uh, for you in that round. Like, some characters want you to win no tricks. Some characters want you to win lots of tricks. Some characters let you bid on the number of tricks that you're going to be taking. Some characters throw their hand away and then draw special cards from a unique deck. Some characters get items that they can then consume at various points. Uh, another character will make poker hands out of the cards that they've taken through tricks at the end of the hand and try to get points that way. And there's like four different ways that you can win um, through getting gold crowns and black crowns and getting victory points and just also there's just instant win uh, conditions where it can be the second round and you do a specific thing based off of the character that was really hard to do and you just win the game and you stop immediately. This is a surprisingly complex game, at least as far as all of the different rules for the different characters. It's also in Japanese, so um, <laughs> if you buy this game, it comes with a bunch of Japanese, but there's a thriving community on the Portland Games Discord all about uh, English translated paste-ups so that you can play this game you know, with English actually on these. Uh, I played this game once. I thought it was fine, but I've also put dozens of hours into building a scripted TTS mod for this one. It's not public yet, but I've been working with the designer of it, so I'm hoping to make that one public at some point in the future so that more people have access to this game. Um, 
I think it's fun. It's not my favorite game, but for some people, it is absolutely their favorite game. It was talked about at great length on the Trick Talkers podcast, which is a podcast I suggest. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, definitely listen to their episodes about it because they go into it in great depth. But this is just a really fascinating game that I just learned about recently, and I know all about it because, again, the dozens of hours coding a TTS mod for it, um, even though I've actually only played this one once. All right, next up we have Uptown. Uh, this says, build the most prestigious skyscrapers and win the contract to build an entire suburb, which, like a lot of these uh, little blurbs, is somewhat generic. Now, the reason I'm talking about this game is because uh, of the images. How many times have I said that in these two episodes? Um, in this one, it looks like you're going to be building these cards up. But in particular, the thing that drew me to this is the fact that in the description, it says that you can build on your opposing players' spots. Yeah, it says the rules of the game will allow you to cleverly buy up plans and play cards on your rival's buildings, and you want to remember to keep an eye on your budget, and the streets that you build will quickly give you a nice profit, and whoever gets the most prestige points by the end is going to win. Uh, it is a 45-minute game, so relatively quick. Uh, it looks like it has income and market and multi-use cards, open drafting, which you can't really see in the images that they have, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't say this one's lighting my world on fire, but once I read the thing where you can actually build things on your opponent's tableaus, I don't really know what that does for you, but apparently there is an incentive for that. That got me interested in learning more about this one. So I don't know if this is a game that I actively want to play, but it's certainly one that I want to learn more about because it might be something I want to play once I figure out some of these details. All right, we've got four more games to talk about, and this one is Vent. Uh, so this one says, read the wind and manipulate island tiles to lead migratory birds to the world's edge. So there is just an image of the box cover, no images of the components, but the box cover looks really nice. Uh, the artist of this game is Sai Beppu, and it's uh, I I'm starting to hear that name quite often. Um, they've designed the art for a lot of games. 535 is one of them that I talked about uh, in the previous episode, uh, but I really like Sai Beppu's art. Either way, uh, it says in this game you're going to place tiles to change the conditions of islands from one moment to the next and lead migratory birds to the furthest edges of the world. Uh, this is an abstract game with a puzzle element that allows players to connect islands so that migratory birds can move all at once. And in addition to basic and expert rules for two players, three and four players can also play in team games. That's all they have on BGG right now, but that's enough for me to be curious. Uh, this one might be a little bit too simplistic for my tastes. It's a 15 minute game, which is very quick, but um, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about it. You know, I'm subscribed along with like four other people on BGG. Uh, this is likely gonna be a game that I don't actually end up seeking out, but it seems like it's got the, uh, the start of something that I could be quite interested in. So yeah, I'm keeping an eye on it. All right, next up we have Vienna, and this one should be kind of quick. Uh, much like when I talked about Cusco in the previous part, this is a re-implementation of a previous Stefan Feld design. In this case, it's a reimagining of 2014's La Isla, in which players will search to discover spies hidden around the city. I really liked La Isla. I ultimately gave my copy to a friend, but it was a really smart game about drawing three random cards and then trying to figure out how to place those down to get uh, really good benefits. Um, I felt like there were a couple weaknesses to La Isla, in particular, I hate to harp on this, but like card draw luck really seemed to rear its head um, with those cards that you drew. It just seemed like sometimes you could just draw into amazing combos or other times you just couldn't and then really had a hard time uh, actually doing well in the game. Now, La Isla was like a 60 minute game, so it was quite quick overall. And honestly, I would like to play that game more. La Isla, the original one, it's been a few years since I played and I remember really liking it. In fact, I did a full review of it. If you want to learn more about it, then search John Gets Games La Isla and learn all about it. But anyway, this is Vienna. It's a re-implementation or a reimagining. The fact that it says reimagining makes me more hopeful that maybe they're going to tweak some of the rules because, again, La Isla at its core was really good. I mean, I dare say it was brilliant, like a really, really cool design. But there were some things that rubbed me a little bit wrong, as I've said before. So hopefully those get uh, maybe smoothed out a little bit <laughs> in this reimagining. Uh, I'm definitely going to be keeping my eye on Vienna. All right, the second to last game I'm talking about is Zip Zap Zop. Uh, it says, build your deck and win tricks to be the funniest comedian at the improv show. Now, the designer of this game is Taylor Renner, a.k.a. Uh, the guy from Taylor's Trick Taking Table, the wonderful YouTube channel that really focuses on card games like trick taking games and climbing games and all that kind of stuff. His channel is hilarious. I strongly recommend you give it a shot if you haven't heard of it before, but he also designed this game. Uh, so this one's being published by the Portland Game Collective. This is going to be their third published design. Uh, the first one was the uh, Bridge City Poker. The second one was 535 that I talked about in the previous one of these episodes, and this is the third. Um, now, this drew my attention not only because I think Taylor is a great person and <laughs> makes really funny videos, 
videos, but also because it has a unique combination of deck building and trick taking. And I've never even heard of a deck building trick taker before. So that's interesting. Now, the theming of this one is all about improv shows. So I guess like the yes and type of thing. So I think you might be like adding things on. I've not actually play tested this one. All I know about it is what they say here on BGG. But it says that in this game, you're going to play this trick taking game and you get to decide what cards you're going to be dealt. Uh, this new concept gives agency and strategy to a deck building game while maintaining the quick paced tactical nature of a trick taking game. It says it's a 35 to 85 minute game. That is a very hubris <laughs> playtime. Uh, so it says the theme is integrated throughout with players taking on the role of comedians at an improv show. The card play has the players interacting with each other in an improv scene and the new cards that they buy are suggestions from the audience for the next scene. That is wonderful. Uh, it says this is a trick taking game that follows the rules of standard tricks takers with a few differences. Uh, in this one, you may be able to play more than one card in the trick, like I kind of alluded to. It says some cards are modifiers, uh, as I also kind of alluded to. It says if a player ever plays the same number as a previous card, then that player may play an additional card to the trick. Okay, this I think is the part where I was thinking, yes, and like you play a four. Yes, I agree four. And then you're going to put something else that really feels like it goes into the theme. Uh, the played cards then form uh, a new number. Uh, and it says after you play tricks, players will buy cards using the number of tricks that they want as currency. This all sounds super cool. I'm very much looking forward to trying this one and odds are good I'm going to be backing the Kickstarter for this when it ends up going up. I think at some point in the next few months. It's not super soon, but there seems to be a lot of really neat ideas in this one. I think it's certainly worth paying attention to, even though, again, I haven't actually played it, but people I trust have said they really dig it. And again, uh, Taylor is a, a smart guy, so I believe that he'd be able to come up with a cool card game. He has an entire YouTube channel dedicated to talking about them. All right, we've reached the final game I'm talking about today, and it is Zoo Vadis. Um, much like a lot of games I'm talking about today, this is a re-implementation. Specifically, it re-implements Quo Vadis, which came out in 1999, which is a very long time ago. Uh, so it's my understanding, oh, designer Reiner Kinesia. I think I knew that, I just forgot. Anyway, <laughs> the designer is Reiner Kinesia, and in Quo Vadis, as well as Zoo Vadis, um, this is a game that I think has relatively uh, has a relatively low amount of rules. Um, in it, you're trying to move your tokens up this grid, but you kind of help each other. I watched a video about this like a month ago. I just forgot the details of it, but it seems like there's a lot of sharing, maybe not sharing incentives, but certainly uh, sharing perks, like doing a thing to, uh, like I do something using somebody else's token and that person is happy. Like they get some sort of benefit because I use their token and you're just trying to get your tokens up to the top. I think it's a relatively simple game. Uh, I don't even think there's restrictions necessarily. Like you're not rolling a die to see uh, where you can move. I think you're just making smart strategic decisions as you're doing that. And as I said, Zuvatus is a re-implementation of that. Uh, and the art style is out of this world. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I, I absolutely love it. There aren't any images of what the game looks like to play, but the box cover is stunning with anthropomorphic animals. I know some people think that's overdone. I don't think it's overdone, especially when it's done in such a gorgeous style like this. Um, now, this isn't just a straight re-implementation. Uh, down here it says, Zoo Vadis is an evolution of Reiner Kinesia's classic negotiation game. Oh, right, there's negotiation as you're moving these tokens up. It says it retains the elegant political gameplay that fans have come to love while introducing many innovations and improvements. So it seems like it's enhancing the three-player game, it's widening the player count, it's expanding the possibilities of strategic negotiation with asymmetric animal abilities, there are increased tactical opportunities with laurel tokens, there's a broadened appeal with the theme and presentation with this wonderful art by Quan Chai Moria and Bridget Indelicato. And then it says it enlivens the production with chunky animal figures and functional player screens. I'm not sure if this is a game I'm going to love. Generally, I'm not crazy about negotiation games, but this has me super intrigued. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to go up on Kickstarter or anything like that, but uh, once more information comes out about it, specifically of the new board and maybe what all these things are like, I'm definitely going to be looking into it. This feels like a game I'm probably not going to be buying, but that I'm going to actively try to play at least once because it seems like it has a lot of really interesting ideas that I've not necessarily seen before, even though it's a very elegant package. Honestly, I'm just a really big fan of Ragnar Kinesia. So many of uh, his designs are just so elegant, and it seems like this is no exception. And even though it's being re-implemented and evolved and, and some more things are being added on, I am hopeful slash confident that um, they're not going to go away from that elegant core. 
So, yeah, that is 60 games, if you consider the first part, uh, and I, I think I need to give my voice a, br a break. Uh, I've never talked about this many back-to-back. Uh, -back. I recorded these episodes back-to-back, -back, even though I'm releasing them with a little bit of a gap, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this is part of the reason why I try to put these out once a month. Uh, I took a month off, and then I ended up essentially doing that month's worth of games in this episode. So, uh, hopefully, you know, in four to five weeks' time, we'll be putting another one of these out with a more reasonable uh, uh, number. Although, you know, at that point, Essence Spiel will have happened, and I'm sure there will be a bunch more exciting games that I've never even heard about that people will have found at the fair and we'll be talking about. But either way, I hope you enjoyed this. Again, if you have any comments about any of the games I talked about, or if out of these 60 games there are still other games you feel like I missed, then please comment about those down below because I love to uh, learn about new games. Obviously, otherwise, I wouldn't be doing these videos. All right, that's going to bring this one to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.